Right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, today's sessions. Uh, let's begin this time with a word of prayer. Uh, maybe any one of us can please lead us in prayer. The beggar. Uh, is it okay if he can lead us? Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Yeah. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you, thanking you for the gift of life that you've given to us. Father, again, thank you for you said in your word what you did here when you were already 30, you started getting disciples. So, Lord, as we're here, we're also learning on how to be disciples and how to disciple others, Lord. As we are in this session today, Lord, we pray that you bless our teacher, our lecturer, our pastor. Lord, give him the gift of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding so that he can teach us and inculcate into us what will help this and the generation to come. I also pray for my brothers and sisters who are already in this class. Lord, also give us a, a, a way of understanding, just like King Solomon asked you of wisdom. Lord, please, Lord, give us wisdom so that we can serve, serve your flock in the name of Jesus we've prayed. Amen. amen 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 thank you so much to vega all right so uh looks like we're almost coming to the end of our course uh so we've been talking about the uh, ministry of the pastor <clears throat> and we looked at what how jesus led the example as being the greatest shepherd the best uh, the greatest pastor uh, looking after uh, the fold that he was that was under his care and so today we'll go into chapter i think that's chapter 11 and on your notes uh if if you're tracking along on your notes i know that there is uh, uh there are no points there on your notes right so uh what we're going to do is this is still a work in progress but what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh you know just like it says here summarize uh, a few responsibilities uh, of the pastor uh from both the epistles of timothy and first and second Timothy and Titus, right? So we're going to look at the responsibilities of a pastor, right? Now, if any of you are, have you know not been called to be a pastor, or you feel that your calling is something else, it's all right, right? It, it, it you don't have to like switch off. But uh, the point is, uh, we all will get you know these responsibilities may come upon us, uh, and we never know. Uh, when and how those responsibilities come. So, like we were talking about the gifts of the Spirit, they are all, uh, sorry, the, the functions of the ministry, the fivefold ministry, it's all, uh, there are times they're also, you know, entangled, meaning they're all correlate or co work with each other. So, if we feel they're called to be a teacher or an evangelist, uh, these responsibilities, some of these responsibilities will uh, still be. Or, you know available and optional for you to use uh in whatever ministry that you uh, uh that god has called you for right so we'll uh we'll pick up from here responsibilities of the pastor right and i have my notes here but i'm just gonna uh have it open and then want to request maybe few of us to keep your Bibles ready because there's a lot of uh, verses that we're going to read, right? So let's start off, right? First Timothy chapter 4 and verse 14. Let's read that. Let me try and just see if I can. Yes, any one of us can read First Timothy chapter 4 and verse 14. First Timothy chapter 4 verse 14. Do not neglect uh, your gift which was given you through a prophetic message when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Yeah, thank you. And let's also read Second Timothy 1.16. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 16. The Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me 
and was not ashamed of my jail. Right. So thank you so much, Roslyn. Now, Paul is saying in these two verses that the Holy Spirit guides the church in selecting gifted spiritual leaders. Right. And in many places, uh, we see that laying on of hands of the leader, uh, confirming the call of God upon a person. And we see that uh, Paul wrote in many places, he says, uh, I, 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 I was the one who uh, you know, chose him. Uh, and he says to the church in Ephesus, uh, writing to Timothy, he says, "Lay ha lay hands uh, on your on the leaders and pray for them." Right. So, one of the responsibilities of a pastor is to know or to recognize the gifts that people have. Right. To recognize um, your congregation to recognize their calling. Now, many a times, people who come into church, they they don't know, right? They don't know what is their uh, calling, or they're just coming to church just to, you know, OK, because it's Sunday and I have to be at church. Uh, but they don't know that, OK, there's a calling. There's something that God has called each one of us for. Yes, there's the general calling, but there's also a specific calling. Now, as a leader, right, as a pastor, it's very important that we recognize that God has placed certain anointings upon people, right? And we must be in a place to recognize that and develop these leaders and develop these people into leaders, into the call of God. Right? Now, this is very important. It's a very important responsibility. Why? Because if I'm not doing the right thing in, in raising up leaders, I'm not going to be effective in the body of Christ. Yes, I can preach Sunday upon Sunday. I can do all the related tasks. But if I'm not raising up leaders, I would say I've failed to be a good pastor. Right? And in many places, we look at the example of the Lord Jesus himself. He, he raised up these 12. He didn't tell them, OK, you're going to be leaders. It was only later on, after teaching them, after you know, towards the end of his ministry, he says, "Each one of you will do, will have a call, will have a say in the ministry ahead." Right? But he recognized their potential. The day the Lord Jesus chose the twelve disciples, he recognized their potential. Look at Apostle Paul. He the moment he saw Timothy, Timothy was about 17 years old. The moment he saw Timothy, he recognized, okay, one day this young boy can be a good leader for the church. Right? Uh, now, when we are choosing leaders, there are a few things that we must always be remember we must always be careful about uh, and prayerfully choose leaders that's why uh, in the verse that we read it says that uh, you know it, it is a call of god upon their lives so we must be careful but even as we do it we must see certain things there are certain aspects that are very 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 important there will be people who are very gifted very anointed Right? filled with the Holy Spirit, yet their character or their personal life does not, you know, does not reflect in a good way. Now, what would we do as a, as a, as a pastor, as a leader? Right, always see that okay, what this person can be. But we, as leaders, as pastors, we need to teach them in the right way train them in the right way right uh, let them know that you know there's i always tell people this i mean your gifts and your callings can take you somewhere right you can take you up the ladder but it's your character only that can keep you there right be a very anointed preacher teacher and all of that rise up the ladder people will recognize you all of it but for you to stay there your character needs to be right right uh, and, and and so it's, even as we are raising up leaders, make sure that 
the leaders that we raise up are built in character also not only okay the word yes that's that's prominent that's the first priority but also character All right see give them the smallest task see if they're faithful in that give them the most menial task right see if they're faithful in that and if they're faithful in that it shows their character right? they're willing to serve no matter what right so it's very important as as a as a pastor in the pastoral calling to the main responsibility is to recognize and train leaders right let's look at the next one the spiritual leader is entrusted with the standard of sound teaching right sound teaching and the leader is to guard with the help of the holy spirit right the spiritual leader is entrusted with a standard of sound teaching let's read second timothy chapter third chapter 1 verse 13 and 14 second timothy 1 13 and 14 second timothy chapter 1 verse 13 and 14 what you heard from me keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ. God, the good deposit that was entrusted to you, got it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. Right. Thank you, Jafina. Now we see here two things here. It says there, keep the pattern of sound teaching. Right. Now, Paul is writing to uh, Timothy and he's telling Timothy, there's a lot of things happening around lot of doctrines a lot of new understandings that are happening but you keep the sound teaching that i have taught you right that's one and the second portion says guard the good deposit that has been entrusted to you right so what is the next responsibility of uh, the pastor one to keep sound teaching is your teaching in line with the word of god does it anything that we preach and teach must be aligned to God's word? Sound teaching. Now, in a day and age that we are living in, there are so many, so, so many doctrines that have come up. Some are all right, but some are false. You could just say it's false. Uh, and, and what happens is they've started off well. But somewhere along the line, they've gone away from the truth. That's why Paul says, guard the deposit that has been given to you. So when we read the word, when the word goes into our heart, we need to guard it. And so as leaders, as pastors, we have this awesome privilege of ministering this word in, sound, in a sound way, sound teaching. Right, you know, uh, you know. Sometimes when I think of it, it's it, it's just so such an honor. It's uh, you know whether there are ten people, whether there are ten thousand people, it does not matter because we are going by this word of God, which is the true living word of God. And as pastors, we must make sure that there's no dilution to the word of God, the sound teaching of God's word. That. Another thing that I've noticed is when people don't understand something from the scriptures, we make up our own thing. And when we make up our own thing, it becomes a false doctrine. Right? Uh, if we don't understand certain things, let it go. Prayerfully wait on the Lord, wait on the Lord, keep reading, keep trying to understand. And, and slowly the Lord will bring revelation. Right. There are many things in the book of Revelation I'm still learning. Right? I'm still trying to understand, okay, how is this going to happen? But it does not mean it's not going to happen. Just because I don't understand it, I can't come up with my own assumptions. Right? I can't say, no, how can Jesus come back uh, to the to Israel, to Jerusalem, you know, build, sit on the temple there? It does not make sense. How can he come back? He'll not come back. Now, what am I doing? Because I don't understand, I'm coming up with my own doctrines. Right? 
uh, how can uh, spiritual beings and earthly beings live together during the millennium period it does not make sense now if it does not make sense but but that's what the word of god said so we must stay with a sound doctrine and there are plenty of scriptures all through uh, that we read from the bible uh, which we may not understand but stick to sound doctrine remember the church in uh, thessalonica what did they say said the believers in the church and the people around came and said the rapture has already happened and so paul had to sit write the epistle saying no the rapture has not yet happened don't you know if you read the the letters to Thessalonica, it says uh, don't you know didn't i tell you when i was there that this is what is going to happen uh, in the uh, in the trumpet sound and the twinkling of an eye we'll be transformed we will meet him on the clouds and and he goes on to explain so as pastors make sure that we are teaching sound doctrine if we are unsure about something take some time say that you're not sure right you can go read about it learn ask your you know senior leaders or those who are in the ministry for many years you may have people on who you may know of read about them listen to sermons learn and then if you feel that you are you know this is in line with god's word then go ahead and release it but it's our responsibility and as pastors, it's very important uh, because what we are doing is if we don't feed the sheep good grass and we feed them some, you know, something that is spoiled and some, you know, maybe decayed and something that is uh, smelling and it's not good for the sheep, what is going to happen? The sheep is going to face the consequences because we are giving the food that is not right. And the sheep is going to eat it. But after that, the consequences are bad. And as shepherds, we must be very watchful of what we are teaching. Right? Uh, I remember, uh, you know, just a couple of weeks back, I was listening to a couple of sermons. Uh, and as I was listening to the sermon, you know, my attention was somewhere else. I was just doing something. And the sermon was just, I was just listening to it. And I was surprised because in the middle of the sermon, um, the preacher says, it's a wonderful church, wonderful pastor, big ministry. He says this, God broke the law for love. And that sentence struck me, you know, as I was just, listening to it I, mean, I was not paying attention but I, but when i heard that god broke the law but jesus says i have not come to abolish the law but i to fulfill the law right? and then the preacher went on to give examples that didn't really relate to the scriptures it didn't coincide with the scriptures uh but then i noticed that the whole congregation maybe thousands of people are all clapping and you know whistling and you know they're enjoying the sermon i thought to myself how many of them are going to go back thinking that god broke the law for love that was the sentence he used god broke the law for love uh and uh you know i just thought to myself you see how dangerous it is if we don't uh have sound teaching we can end up just diluting this whole gospel right so make sure that we're sound teaching the gospel right third one if they are to preach and teach the gospel faithfully they are worthy of double honor let's read uh second timothy 5 and 17. second oh there's no five hold on it is i think it's first timothy Yeah, it's First Timothy five seventeen. First Timothy five seventeen. First Timothy chapter five, verse seventeen. The elders who direct the affairs of the church, 
well or worthy of double honor especially those whose work is preaching and teaching thank you so it says there those who preach and teach the gospel faithfully are worthy of double honor now what is the key word here the key word is faithfully we are to preach and teach the word of god the gospel faithfully right so the, another very important responsibility of a pastor is whether we are teaching or preaching to two people or one person or even if it's hundreds or thousands of people we are to preach and teach the gospel faithfully when we do that that is double honor right what an honor that is right all we need to do is preach and teach the gospel faithfully stay faithful to the word of god stay faithful to his promises right staying faithful to the call of god upon our life right uh, you know there's a wonderful scripture it says uh, no man puts his hand to the plow and turns back and goes the other way if he does then there's something wrong he's he's uh, he's weak willed so paul is saying here to timothy just preach and teach faithfully stay faithful to the sound word of god there will be new doctrines coming from all the other way all the other sides people with new ideas new things uh, new uh, doctrines but you stay faithful to the word that has been given to you faithfulness right it's very important responsibility of a pastor now it's very easy to lose faith in a in a journey that we are in right very very easy to lose faith and uh, when we look at what's happening now it is sad and it's disheartening to see pastors and you know ministers of god going back and saying hey i don't believe in god anymore what happened somewhere along the line the enemy has come and stolen that that joy or that that seed of god's word from their heart and from faithfulness they become unfaithful so paul is saying as a pastor be faithful to the gospel be faithful to the word of god right let's go to the next one now another responsibility is pastors must be people whose life and gifts are clearly visible both in their homes and outside of the church and i'll give you the verse second timothy chapter 1 verse 3 to 14 that's a long scripture second timothy chapter 1 let's go ahead second timothy chapter 1 verse 3 to 14 i thank god whom i serve with a pure conscience as my forefathers did as without ceasing i remember you in my prayers night and day greatly desiring to see you being mindful of your tears that i may be filled with joy when i call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you which dwelt first in your grandmother lois and your mother eunice and i am persuaded is in you also therefore i remind you to stir up the gift of god which is in you through the laying on of my hands for god has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our lord nor of me his prisoner but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of god who has saved us and called us with a holy calling not according to our works but according to his own purpose and grace which was given to us in christ jesus before time began but has now been revealed by the appearing of our savior jesus christ who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel to which i was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the gentiles for this reason i also suffer these things nevertheless i am not ashamed for i know who 
I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. That good, that good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rosalind. Now, Paul is just telling uh, Timothy his life testimony. Right? Of course, Timothy knows what's happened in his life, but he's trying to remind him, right? The ones who have been chosen as a pastor must not be novices, but they must be people whose life and gifts are clearly visible to people. Paul saying here, what is he saying? Verse 8, he's saying, do not be ashamed of to testify about our Lord. Do not be ashamed of me, who's a prisoner. Do not be ashamed of the gospel. And he goes on to talk about many other things, right? He says, I was appointed here by Christ. It is not my own work. And so as pastors, as leaders, may our lives be a testimony for people who are watching. That's a very important responsibility of a pastor, right? It is not about preaching, but to live the life that we're preaching about. What does Paul say? He says, um, you know, uh, I don't want to be disqualified from what I myself have been preaching. To the Corinthians, he says that I've been preaching the gospel, and if my life does not show that, then I myself am disqualified. What is the use of me preaching? Right? So picture this. As pastors, you and I have this wonderful responsibility not only in the church, but even at home. We are to be a testimony unto Jesus. Now, I'm reminded of this, uh, this book that I was reading, and this little joke came up, but it was so powerful. Um, you know, it, it really struck me. There was this wonderful man of God, right, who had a big church, and one Sunday he was... I think I've used this example before, but one Sunday he was preaching at church and everyone were just enjoying the message. They clapped and uh, after the sermon, the woman came up to the pastor's wife and said, oh, your husband is such a wonderful preacher. He's so, you know, so anointed, so gifted. Um, but the woman, the preacher's wife didn't seem uh, pleased at all. She was just, you know, nodding her head and uh, they asked her, what happened? Why aren't you... Uh, aren't you, you know, uh, blessed? Aren't you uh, appreciative of your husband who has preached so wonderfully and he's such a great man of God? And the woman says, I wish my home was on that pulpit. Because when we go home, he's a completely different person. He's shouting, he's screaming, he's, you know, always angry, he's, you know, rebuking, he's doing, you know, all the wrong things. But on the pulpit, he's preaching well. Now, what, what what is the testimony there? Church people saying, oh, very good man of God. But at home, your own wife is saying, you know. But that's not what Paul is talking about. Paul is saying, be a good testimony at home and in the church. Right? Many a times, Paul says, follow me. Just as I follow Christ. He's not saying, follow me when I'm in church. Follow me. Follow everything that I've been doing because I am following Christ. Whether people see me, whether people don't see me. Whether I'm alone in the prison cell or whether I'm preaching in front of hundreds of people. Follow my example. Now, as pastors, we have to come to that place. right? We continue to develop and say, God, help me to be a testimony both and the church, to the people I minister to, and at home. Right? Because if I'm only a testimony in the church and not at home, I have failed. If I'm only a testimony in my workplace, and, uh, and, uh, and, or if I'm only a testimony in the church and not in my workplace, I have failed. So as a pastor, we are to be a testimony. We are to lead by example. Right? Uh, I always believe this. What we do 
our the, as a shepherd our sheep will do the same thing right it's it's the calling it's it's the anointing that flows right if if you are a person who for example if there's a pastor who's always gossiping always you know uh, talking bad about people you will find the same thing happening in the church now it's nobody's fault but our fault because we have not set the example right right if if there's a pastor who's always um, you know uh, maybe is going through uh, some you know uh, living a life that is sexually immoral you will find the same thing in the church you'll find it now how can this pastor go and you know minister to those who are you know going through these challenges in life when he himself is in a pit um and the lord jesus says it's the blind leading the blind that's not what we want to do we need to be an example and when we are right we can come to a place to speak into people's lives right it's very important uh, as pastors we have to maintain integrity in our life right learn over time of course we will make mistakes but we learn over those mistakes okay i made a mistake god help me not to make this mistake again help me to grow help me to uh, you know develop and you know, and to build myself and wisdom uh, and i think uh, one of the greatest challenges for pastors and leaders of course across uh, the church is wisdom you know paul says the gifts of god are irrevocable just because you know we are preaching and there's healing and miracles it is god's work right it's god's gift god is god is doing his work right uh, when the word is preached god will do his work there will be miracles now the, we as people may have sinned and all of that but god is still doing his work but what is it we must always come to a place by saying god it's not about me a, a, a cleansing of our own lives should happen continually right so again as pastors we must be a testimony right we must be people who can say follow me this is a follow christ and it comes over time but we can right we can it's the same holy spirit who works in us so to pastors who are here now and you're already leading a church or you're leading a small group what you do is of you know very very important but right. if you're starting a church service 10 minutes late every sunday don't expect the congregation to come early right you have to be there early you have to set the example right and then they can follow it right so next one the pastors must be gifted in managing their household and also managing the household of god First Timothy three four to five. First Timothy chapter three was four to five. First Timothy chapter three was four to five. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his family, how can he take care of God's church? Right. So powerful words from the Apostle Paul. He says, "Now it's 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 interesting to see the Apostle Paul doesn't have family and children, right? But he's look at the wisdom of God upon his life." the man who you know did not was not there for the lord's supper but he says what i received from the lord i give to you the man who was not married writes about husband and wives the man who did not have children uh, writes about children how important it is for children to obey parents right that was the wisdom of god and paul is writing and he's saying as leaders as pastors learn how to manage your family and i think this is an area where as pastors we have failed big time right we don't know how to manage our family but we are very good at managing the church right 
and, and so we need to get that right like we must come to a place where say okay family you know we we always say this right when you when we ask people uh, what is priority god or family uh, obviously people will say god uh, yes god is priority but family is what god created so you can't separate them into two different boxes you can't say okay this is god and then this is family no god and family coexist with each other god is the one who gave you the family so he has put children he has put family under our care and we must take care of it right so as pastors we must never and i was sharing i think last week with the uh, with the uh, first year students on how you know so many friends that i have right who are pastors children but they hate going to the church they're friends of mine they don't like going to the church they've been brought up in the church all their life right they, their parents are pastors so all their life they've been brought up in church and i asked my friends i said hey you know i i mean they were, we we were all friends and we're still friends but i always out of curiosity i always ask them why you don't like church you know what they say because my my dad and mom like people in the church more than me that is the number one answer that we get my parents like the church more than me from the time I was small till about 17 years old or 18 years old till I joined college, I think only once we went out as a family. And so this my friend, he was, you know, he was sharing with me. And you know, he's an alcoholic, drug addict, pastor's son. Now, who is to blame? I can't say all the blame is on him for choosing the wrong things, but even the parents. Because all the left go for prayer meeting, go for this meeting, go for that meeting. And they have a house, and right next to the house is their hall, church hall. So the half the time the parents are there. And they have a few church uh, people who would come and cook in the house. And they would come and you know give him the food he would eat. There was no time. That's what he was sharing with me. There was no time I could sit with my parents and talk and have. I don't remember when was the last time we had lunch together in the house. Either my mother would have gone or my father would have gone. I'm the only son. They had some church people at home who would look after me. I don't know who they are. But whatever I needed was there. And if I need some books, or if I need some toys, I need a cycle, I need anything that is needed materially was there. But they were not there. And as I was hearing this, uh, it, it really, you know, the Lord was ministering to me. And I said, God, help me never to come to this place. The parents, I speak to the parents always, they, they are crying. He's my only son. We raised him up in the right way. Always took him to church. Always uh, asked him to be in the you know, worship team. Got him a drum kit, uh, thinking that he will play drums. Always asked him to you know, sit for Bible study. You know, this man was... The ministry is in the ministry for many, many years. But somehow I mustered up the courage and I said, Uncle, I think you need to go back to understanding your son. He's lost his childhood. He doesn't, He when I was talking to him, he said, I've never gone out with a family. So I asked him, Uncle, when did you go? When did when was the last time you went in uh, as a family? No, we cannot go. If we go, who will look after the church? I said, you're still saying that. Right? And Paul is saying, you're, how can somebody look after the church of God when he is not able to manage his own house? Now, the ministry may be going well, but he's broken. His wife is broken. His son is broken. The whole church keeps asking, you know, hey, why did this happen to him? They're all praying for him. That's wonderful. But it's, you know, instead of uh, instead of doing the right thing, of course, out, sometimes it's out of ignorance. And we're all praying that he comes back to the Lord. But this is what he is, he's saying. So he doesn't like church. He doesn't like church people. You, you know, he says, I have seen their lives. There's something else in the church. And then when they go out, there's something else. Right. Uh, but here it's very important 
Paul is writing to Timothy. We don't know whether Timothy was married, whether he had children, but I'm sure he's he's exhorting the people within the church as well, leaders and overseers and deacons in the church. He's saying, look after your family. If you don't do that, how can you look after the church? Right, And this problem is real. So as pastors, the responsibility of looking after the family is very important. Spending time with family, spending personal time with your wife, with your children, uh, praying for them, spending time together, being there for them. Very important. Because there will come a time the children will grow up, they'll be 15, 16 years old, and you will not have a right to speak into their life because they, you were not there when they needed you. Right? So I make a conscious decision. Well, my boys, they're, they're growing up now. But I'm, whenever they say, I make a decision, I have to drop them and pick them up from school. It doesn't matter what time it is. It doesn't matter if it's raining, whether it's thunder, storms are coming, or whatever is coming. I drop them, drop him to school, pick him up from school. Make sure I do it. I personally want to do it. Are there school vans and school bus? Yes, but I want to do it. And during the way, I talk to him, just spend time, just finding out, you know, uh, just letting him know about school, what 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 you should do, what you shouldn't do. It's it, there are small things that make a difference, right? So if if you are in that place with children, spend time with them. And you know, sometimes I look back at these, you know, photos that we took when they were kids, and I feel, oh man, they've grown up so fast. They were just one year old, two years old. Now they've grown up so fast. And now they want, you know, friends more than family. Right? So it's very important that you come to a place where you know that you're doing the right thing in your family. Right? So Paul is very importantly, Paul is telling the congregation, the leaders, especially pastors, look after your family. Um, next one, pastors are to wholly give themselves up to the scriptures. The pastor's attention is directed to the truth. First Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4. Let's read that. First Timothy 2 and verse 4. First Timothy chapter 2 verse 4. Who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth? This is a very important point for pastors. To bring all of them to be saved and to bring them to the knowledge of the truth. Right? The pastor's attention should be directed to the truth of God's word. Right? Now, we always say this, right? Don't give the devil pulpit time. When you, as pastors, when we are preaching and teaching, focus on the truth. Jesus says, the truth will set them free. Now, the wrong thing to do is to go up on the pulpit and begin to talk about everything else, what others are doing. Or what this person is doing, what that ministry is doing, doing all of that. Bringing out all the wrongs of what's happening around. And then spending the last five minutes on the truth of God's word. No. As pastors, we must focus on the truth. Remember that people come from different backgrounds. There will be people from different faiths. Let the truth of the word of God touch their lives. Right? Remember, truth is greater than what is false. Light is greater than darkness. Right? So you, you speak the truth. You know, the wrong thing to do is to say, hey, you know, this religion does this, this religion does that, but this is what Jesus did. You don't have to, you know, talk about all the other things. Jesus said, just speak the truth. The truth will set them free. Right? The word of God. So we must direct people to the truth of God's word. Not direct them to ourselves, but to, to the truth of God's word. Okay, we'll look at one more point and then we'll take a break. To the sound words of the Lord Jesus, the pastors are to lead people to the sound words of the Lord Jesus and the teaching 
that is in accordance with godliness. We are to discipline them in godliness and discipline them in, in the things of life. So as pastors, we must be disciplined in our personal life and also discipline the sheep that are in our fold. We have a responsibility of encouraging and exhorting our congregation, telling them to pray, set time aside for prayer, set time aside for reading of the word of God, set time aside for the things of God, uh, uh, family prayer. We have the responsibility of exhorting the congregation. Right? It's, it's a responsibility. We must do it. We must discipline the sheep. Imagine a sheep does, uh, sorry, a shepherd does not discipline a sheep. I love what uh, David says, your rod and your staff. What is the rod used for? And what is the staff used for? Right? The staff is to gently pull the sheep that is going astray. The rod is to whack it when it keeps going away, right? So there will be times uh, discipline is important. We have to discipline ourselves and then discipline our church members. Now, there will, we all we can do is we can share with them the importance of being disciplined in life. Now, there will be people in a congregation who are at different spirit, maturity levels, right? Spiritually, they're, they're in de at different levels. So some people will take it, some people won't take it. Now, for those who don't take it, don't push them. Don't be stern. Don't be rude to them. Right? Just, just move on. Right? But focus on those who have, you know, made a decision to discipline themselves, build them up, continue to exhort them, continue to build them in the word and the faith. Right? Uh, and and discipline is important for the pastors. And when they are disciplined, they, they can they will be able to talk and speak into the members' lives, right? The congregation's life. All right, we'll take a break, we'll come back and we'll continue with a few more points and uh we'll look at a few rewards as well for the pastors. All right, let's take a break, come back. <laughs> 